So, Mr. Thomas, I see you went to college at Bishop College. Were there a lot of colleges recruiting you when you came out of high school? No. I only played football one year my senior year, and I was an undersized guy that played a lot of baseball and basketball for the high school in my senior year. Two of my friends came and said, man, you're a pretty good athlete. They said, won't you come out and play last year? And I played wide receiver my last year at uh, Marshall High School, which was predominantly all-black school, total segregation in Angleton, Texas, which is about 40 miles south of Houston. And so I didn't get any offers, but I, my best friend and my first cousin went to Bishop College. They both got scholarships. So I, so I followed them there, and I was just a student playing sandlot. And one of the assistant coaches came by doing the all season and said, man, you're a pretty good athlete. Why don't you come out for the team next year? So I went out for the team my sophomore year, made the team, they gave me a scholarship. So what was it like playing at Bishop College? Well, I knew nothing else. You know, uh, at that particular time, it was, you know, we didn't have the best equipment. We didn't have the real big guys or the blue chip athletes. But we had a lot of good, small athletes that tried hard. And uh, we had a coaching staff that uh, gave us an opportunity to try to learn and techniques and get us better. And uh, so I was going in, but it was a lot of fun. It, it made school very enjoyable. Did you play against, like, the Gramblings in college? And yes, the, I uh, did. Matter, matter of fact, played against uh, – and we were in the conference with Gramblings, Jackson State, Southern, Wiley College, Texas Southern, and Prairie for a while. And then uh, we were too weak for them, so they put us out. And then the following year, we won our conference. They, and they won there the SWAC, and we played Bremen in the Sugar Cup Bowl my senior year. How did you do in that bowl game? Pretty well. They beat, they beat us. They were, we were out man, out gun. They were a fantastic football team, but had a lot of uh, a lot of fun playing against good athletes and got some exposure. So when you play, went to Kansas City, they were a developing team. They hadn't hit their peak yet. What was it like no. playing for Coach Stram? It was great. He was a great innovator, uh, real cocky, very intelligent, and very, very competitive. Very competitive and smart. Whatever we what he did, he was very competitive. So it was a lot of fun. And then what was there, a lot of the black people, I knew them because they were from Gramlin, Jackson State, Southern, Prairie View. So I knew them before even getting to the team, which made me feel a little bit more comfortable. And then most of the white players were from uh, the Southern College. They were from the Auburns, the Alabamas, Tennessee, and uh, Texas, TCU, Texas Tech. So I knew their names, but they never played against But all the black players I had played against on that team. I think Tennessee State was the only team that we hadn't played. So when you joined the Chiefs, you had some great players on defense. You had Buck Buchanan, Bobby Bell, Willing Lanier, your um, Johnny Robinson. I mean, you were just loaded. What was it like on that defense? It was nice. Johnny Robinson was already there, and, and Lanier came the year after me. But uh, but they had Bobby Bell, Buck Buchanan, Jerry May. Uh, they had some they had some good athletes. They needed a uh, a couple corners to go with the with their defense, and I was fortunate enough to get there in the year that they were looking for corners. And a guy by the name of Fletcher Smith, who was from Tennessee State, that was drafted in the eighth round, he and I were friends before we got there, and then we both made the team together. And then when so, the – go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. I Sorry to interrupt you. And then when the alignment became, and uh, they, they, they kept me and let him go to Cincinnati in the expansion draft. So who was the leader of the defense? I'm going to say Buck Buchanan. Buck Buchanan was our – he and Jerry Mays. And then when Lanier came, he he, he became there. But Lanier came a year after I did. He and Jim Lynch came in together. Playing on that defense, what was it like? I mean, what made you guys so great? 
You know what? I, I think it was because a lot of us had played different positions. I was a quarterback. Jim Kearney was a quarterback in college. Uh, Bobby Bell was the next quarterback. Uh, we all played different positions, and we were just happy to be on a team that we could play together and was very competitive. And we all knew each other prior to coming to Kansas City, especially the black players. We all knew each other and about each other and played against yeah. each other. And then we were fortunate enough to have a defense coordinator by the name of uh, Tom Bettis who went to Purdue, and uh, he put a couple of schemes together where we could play. And uh, at that time, you could be able to be physical at the line and bump and run. And, and so that helped a lot of us grow and learn the game then. So going against that offense every day, I mean, you were covering with Otis Taylor, who you mentioned previously. How how hard was that on you? It, it was hard, but it was, it was very rewarding. And, you know, we had Dawson as a quarterback, and he threw a complete a couple of balls, then you knocked down one, and then they kept one. He'd always stick his hand in our house there. Emmett or Jimmy or uh, Jim Kearney or Jim Marshall, Emmett. Could you have got that? Uh, what do I need to do to make that completion? You since you knocked it down or you you picked it off. And so he interchanged uh, information to each other. We were very astute to help each other out, whether he was on offense, special teams, uh, or on defense. And it was like a family atmosphere. And uh, we all got along real well. And I think Lynch, Lynch and Lanier were the first black and white uh, athletes were sleeping in the same room in the dorm and on the road, and things just just mellowed out. And, you know, when you're winning, all that kind of jail. And uh, if it wasn't for the Raiders, we would have been known as one of the better teams in the history of the NFL. We just not could not get to, get to hold to them. We played them ten times. We might well win three or four times, and they win the rest. We played a lot of seven, six, twelve, ten games, but never could get over the hump until they even went to the Super Bowl. What made the Raiders so tough? Athletic and tough. Tough, and they believed in each other. Had great athletes. Some of the best receivers and athletes you ever want to see. So when you played the Raiders, did you be covering – Cliff Branch, or would you have Fred Bolitnikoff, or I, had, other guy? I only played against uh, Fred one time, but the majority of the time we stayed right and left with Nick, I mean, Nick, Marcellus and myself. So I covered Branch and Warren Wells, who people do not realize from Texas of how great he was at cooking. One of the finest receivers I've ever seen to this day and back then. What made him so tough? Quick, mean, and fine hand, and he understood the game. But real tough. You couldn't. You, you, you. And some Sunday, I know I put some shots on him. He'd be bleeding out the nose. He'd come right back at you. Come right at you. Keep dropping that. He comes right back at you. But it's fantastic athlete. You mentioned that Willie Veneer was uh, roommates with Lynch. Whose idea was that? I think it was Hank. It was Hank. He put was there any? Was there any? Uh, basically, was Lanier and Lynch okay with that, or they didn't have a choice? Yeah, I don't think they had a choice. And I'm, I'm sure after getting to know Lynch and and Lynch and then later on, it was okay with him because Lynch was away in. Uh, in an all-star game, and the Nils was in camp before he got there. When he got there, his role was already assigned, and I, I think the Nils really came more as an outside linebacker, and Lynch was going to be the middle linebacker. But after he didn't get there because of the all-star game, the Nils got there, they kept the Nils in the middle, and, and then Lynch protect, protected me on the on the right side for 10 or 11 years. What was amazing was that William Lanier was the first black middle linebacker. At the yeah, time. I know. But I don't I don't know if they had a came there together and got to camp the same day would have worked out that way. You'd have to ask him there. But uh, once Lynch got there and he moved outside to the right linebacker slot, we never thought nothing about it and never missed a beat. He was better with the Willie Lanier as a roommate to Bobby Bell because Bobby would have talked to him all night. 
Bobby Bell's a roommate with Buck, see? Oh, okay. But can you being roommates with Bobby Bell? He never he never stops talking. All the time. He still does. All the time, right now. All the time. <laughs> That's why I thought he was the leader of the defense with the amount of times he talked and everything like that. But I was no, surprised no, he was no, Buck no. no. Buck Buchanan, Jerry Mays, and then Willie Lanier. So Bobby knew his place. I doubt it's not too much, huh? So Bobby knew his place in the team that it was their team. They were the leaders. Right. So when you yeah, made Super, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. So, to you. What you think? so when you made Super Bowl four, what was that game like against the Vikings? I don't want to seem cocky. I don't want to seem arrogant because that's not my lifestyle. And I know that's not the lifestyle of a lot of athletes on our team. But looking at them on tape. And watching them play, we knew if we didn't really beat ourselves, we were a much bigger, stronger, and faster team than they were. Offensively, we knew we had a weapon in Otis Taylor, Mike Garrett, Lynn Dawson, and we had a fantastic, fantastic kicker in Leon Stenero. And if we just played decent on defense, just decent. Not not just great, but we played decent that we had a chance. We were going to win the football game. We were a better football team. And the other cornerback was what, Fred Williamson, I believe? Uh, that was the first Super Bowl. The second Super Bowl, there was Jim Marcella from Tennessee State, who okay. made defensive rookie of the year that year. Fantastic football player and player. That first Super Bowl with the Packers, what was that like? That was my rookie year, so I played a lot of special teams, and I didn't get any playing time except in the last quarter when Fred Williamson got uh, dinged in the head, and I went and finished the game up. But to me, being a rookie of free agent from Bishop College to go to a championship game on a Super Bowl your rookie year was mind-boggling. And it didn't register to me until we lost the game, how important it was until we got back in the dressing room. And uh, we kept saying, well, we'll be back next year. And, you know, I tell players that when I was coaching, don't never say you come back to next year because ain't nothing guaranteed. It took us four years to get back and win it. And then it took cancer another, what, 53, 54 years before they got there again. So you should enjoy every moment of it, every trip, every play and try to play it to your fullest and your best and let the chips fall where they may. So after you made one Super Bowl four, you were the second AFC team to do it. Did you think, you know what, we have a chance to get to a couple more or was your defense just aging or was it be more difficult? No, we we took we towed the team up a little bit then once we won. I don't say throw it up, but we lost a lot of key players. And uh, and most of us in our team, most of us was around 20, 26, 25, 26, 27, 28, in that area, 29. We were, we were young enough, but the Pittsburgh had gotten stronger. The Raiders were steady strong, and then Miami had hit, hit their peak. You have some tough teams on the AFC side. Pardon me? Who was the toughest receiver you had to go against? Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, would pick, I would pick three, but I'm going to name them in order. I would say uh, Paul Warfield, Warren Wells, and Greg Lindicott. Why was Warfield so tough? He was just quick, great hands. They'd put him in positions where he could be successful. Great athlete. He's quick, had enough passing, had great jumping ability, and uh, very intelligent in route running. All three of those guys, Belinda Carr and Cooley, were, were great route runners. I see you had 58 interceptions, and that was at a time when they weren't passing as much, even though the AFL passed more than the NFL. Why was that, do you think? Uh, can I pat myself on? I had great, I had great Go pressure up front. The scheme that Tom Bellis put us in, and I had 
being a baseball player and being an outfielder, I had pretty good ball skills. I mean, if I look down through my history, I might have dropped three intercepts, sheer interceptions in my whole career. I mean, where it just actually hit me in the hand and dropped. So I had pretty good ball skills. I had a lot of pressure from uh, up front. And, uh, of course, put us in great position. And I had Lanier and Lynch in front of me. And we talk. I said, I'm going to play inside shade, so make you drop outside. I said, I'm going to play outside in this play here, make you drop inside of this guy. So I could I could see the quarterback, see the hand. So it was a great communication with the guy that hang down in front of me. And Johnny would stay deep and rob anything to the post, so we knew we'd protect it to the post. How did you know when it was time to retire? <clears throat> I didn't really lose speed, but I lost quickness, redirecting. So we got a we got a turn we call speed turn. When I could not make the tight speed turn, I knew then that uh, it was over. I could run four five three four five two when I when I retired, but I couldn't redirect, couldn't speed turn like I used to. Because when I came in, I was running like a 4-3 flat, 4-3-3. So that lasted for a long time. So the speed stayed there because I stayed in pretty good shape. But I could not speed turn. So how did you get into coaching? Tom Bettis. Uh, during the off season, you know, we we had jobs. So I would go to work every day and then come back and eat. And I always stopped by the office and, they would be cutting up film and slicing, making tapes and stuff for the upcoming season. So I'd stop in and help him out 30 or 40 minutes uh, every day when he was there before I uh, went home. He say, he called me and say, you look like you're taking a nap for this thing. You want to be a coach when you finish? I said, yeah, I think I would. Yeah. He said, well, just keep learning and keep working and keep your nose clean and uh, – when you get through, if I'm still in it and I can help you, then uh, I'll do that. And uh, when I retired in 78, I coached two years at Central Missouri State. And then the St. Louis Cardinals had a position open on that staff. I was thinking I was going over there to be on defense with him. But uh, Jim Hamilton, who was the head coach, said, you covered him. And uh, I want you to work with the receiver. So he had me as a receiver, tight end coach, that for five years. And How hard was it that. to go from defense to offense? It wasn't because being on defense, you know, certain backfield sets, what they usually run from it, uh, what they usually pass from, and uh, just getting the terminology down was a big thing for me. But you've seen the drill that the offensive receivers did, all your training camps and the direct receivers and stuff. And then I had help, you know. So it worked out well for me. It gave me a good base to know about offense. And then when we got fired after five years, the Redskins gave me an opportunity. Joe Gibbs and Pete Bethard came in and gave me an opportunity. And I coached the receivers there for one year, and then the rest of the time, the other eight or nine, I was on defense at the defensive side. When you were with the Cardinals, I've really been blessed. When Pardon you were with the Cardinals, did you, when you were with the Cardinals, was it your decision to make Roy Green a wide receiver instead of a cornerback? Well, when I interviewed for the job and uh, watched some tape for a couple of days, because Hamilton called me in, he said, "Well, what you do with this guy?" I said, "What do he love to do?" He said, "He loves to catch the ball." I said, well, right now, we need help on, still need help on defense. I said, but I'd let him play both ways if he could. And I just, Jim Hamilton said, oh, you know what? We had been thinking about doing some of that anyway. And that's how I developed. And Roy and I developed uh, a great relationship there and uh, finally switched over full time to receiver. So with the Redskins, you go there, you got some great receivers, Hall of Famer, Art Monk. Was it easy going from the Colonels to the Redskins, knowing that they had such a great offense? Oh yeah, definitely. And the defense wasn't bad. You know, <laughs> it, it was it was a, it was a 
it was a team already ready for the Super Bowl or championship game. They just had to get a few of a break here and there, and then Dale Green had to mature just a little bit, and I went over and worked with him a little bit on the pedagogue, and we didn't do much of it. We just say, hey, try to get your hands on him more at the line of scrimmage, and uh, don't peep in the backfield and let him work. And oh, Sanders Gary Clark what, and, mm-hmm. Yeah, you had Gary Clark and what, uh, Sanders? Yeah, and you had Sanders, Ricky Sanders, Gary Clark, Art Mott. All that was, that, that, that's built in for success right there. Did you, how did you, did you realize that Joe Gibbs was going to be a Hall of Fame coach when you were there? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. A very caring person, very smart very hard worker and uh, he had a couple of people around him that could give him talent and better in and your defensive and coordinator guy. was a former defensive back too and Richie Pettibon right yeah, he played safety with the bear yeah yeah so you had some and great he, minds with you and Richie on defense yeah you you can see his uh some of his disciples working there, and Todd Bowles, who's down in town, but I was, I was safe to see the call along with the rest of the So when you, so that, when you left the Redskins, you went to the Eagles as a defensive coordinator in the mid-90s. What was that like over there? With the Eagles? Yes. A lot of fun, a lot of fun, because Ray Rose was the head coach. And he brought in a lot of veteran players that he knew when he was with the 49ers. And we had a pretty good draft. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, sorry that it didn't go fun as far as we would have liked it in the playoffs. But I think our first two years we got any playoffs. The last two we didn't, and then we got a league. But it was a lot of fun, a lot of growing up, a lot of learning football, and then some some nice people. Was it tough on your wife and family moving around when you were coaching? Because after you left the Redskins, it seemed like you bounced around for a while. Let, let, let me tell you, I was fortunate enough that I started my family early. So when I came into the cold, I was married and I had a, a five-month-old son. And then my daughter was, was born another five years. So I had two kids. But the thing that helped me is my, all through my praying career, I was right there in Kansas City for 13 years right there. And then, of course, I sent to Missouri State down the road for another. So I was in the area for 15 years without moving my family, family or kids. So when I started moving around, they were all, they were all, my son was in college. My daughter was the only one that caught the brother, Deidre. So then... You ended up going to the Falcons in 2002. How did that come about? The Falcons? Yes. Okay, I had went to Green Bay. We were only there for a year. And then I went to uh, Minnesota for two years, and we lost terrible. I was a coordinator. We lost terrible in the uh, championship game to go to the Super Bowl. And then that was my first year there. And then the next year, we didn't make it. And then I was released. And then after I was released, then uh, uh, I went to the Falcons with Dan Lee for eight years. Great eight years. Got you mentioned championship. You mentioned losing the championship game with the Vikings. That's the year that you guys were undefeated going into the championship game? No, we had lost the game. We had uh, one game. Year. Yeah. But that's when we had uh, the receiving call. Oh, Chris Carter Moss, and Randy Moss? Randy Moss and Dante Cole, a couple of the quarterback. And then we had the running back from Ohio State. Uh, Robert Smith? Robert Smith. We had a couple other guys. And... Uh, we're pretty good. We're pretty soft, and we didn't play well on either side of the ball. They pulled us out. Was John Randall there at that time? Who? John Randall. Oh yeah, 
Yeah, he was there. He was all he was all guy up in the mill. Raising John heaven, Randall. Yeah. John Randall said that he used to get background information on the offensive linemen and basically get in their heads. Did you know he was doing that when he he was uh you were coaching him? Yeah, he talked so much. You know, he's just like Bobby Bell all the time. He's a chatterbox, so he would always uh, find something to kind of egg him on a little bit. So, but that's one of the things he did well, and he was so quick and powerful. And a guy his size, you know, a lot of offensive line would underestimate his strength and uh, his quickness. But uh, he's a fantastic uh, inside uh, player. Great three technique. Great three technique. As you can know, he's in the hall. So. So, but if you meet him right now, he's still talking a lot. <laughs> him and Bobby could talk all night. Oh, yeah. That'd be a hell of a conversation you got both of them again. I don't know if they listen to each other. They just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so did you feel like you should have been named a head coach before Atlanta did in 2007? Before Atlanta. I thought I had a shot when I was at uh, Philadelphia. I had a couple of interviews, and uh, it didn't work out. But I, I thought I was going to get a shot then. And I, I, I think the thing that really snuffed it out was when I was with the Vikings and we played the Giants in the championship game, and I was defense coordinator. Just being honest with you, we got through out, and I think that snuffed it there. And it was early. It was early in, in, in uh, my career too. Uh, you know, when many guys getting that opportunity, I was, Ray Rose and I used to talk about it all the time. And he promised me, and I promised him, if we didn't want us to get a shot, we were gonna make the other one the their defense coordinator because he was a secondary coach, and I was a secondary coach. He was with the Forty Niners, and I was with the uh, Redskins. As a matter of fact. We used to meet up during the off season and go work our players out together. And he always promised, if I get a job, man, you're going to be my DC. I said, if I get one, you're going to be my DC. And it worked out for us. It really did. I was so happy for him and proud of him. I thought we could have got a little bit more out of his career, but it didn't work out that way. But uh, if we could have gotten the quarterback, I think it really uh, would have worked out for us. So you were his D.C. when he was with the Packers as their head coach for that year? For me? Were you his defensive coordinator when he was the Packer coach, Ray Rose? Yeah, when he was with uh, the Packers and also Philadelphia. So when you became the head coach of the Falcons, what was that like? It, it was nice. It was wonderful. And I'm thinking I got a false impression of it because everything was kind of put in place anyway. And all I did was ask some of the coaches and brought a five-man player committee in and asked them was there is anything we could do to change and make us be more successful. We have about three games, yeah. And they said, no, not much. But uh, we changed a few practice, you know, times and schedules like that. But the travel and everything else was already put in place. So, But uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And I wouldn't trade it back for nothing in the world. And, you know, to play in this league, coming from a little farming community in Anglican, Texas, going to a, almost a division three school at Bishop College, not being drafted, a walk on at uh, in college, you know, free agent in uh, Kansas City, and to go to two Super Bowls, we, we lost the first one and won the fourth one. Then to go to Redskins and win two of the assistant coaches and meet all the nice coaches and players, fantastic players that you interacted with. And then when they were staying in the league almost 50 some years, I feel real blessed and uh, I have no regrets. When you joined Kansas City, you were there for from 2010 to 2018. Again, you seem like you always got close, but just couldn't get over the hump. Right. What? Well, why was it? Do you think you just didn't have a quarterback that could take you all the way, or just the luck of the draw? I, I try to tell. Sometimes it's the luck of the draw, but and I don't not want to point the thing of it and anything. And you've been in sports and writing about that, and you know if you don't have the trigger puller, you've got to have a quarterback to win in this league. 
I don't care how great your defense is, how great your special team is. If you can't score points or you don't have no no guy at the quarterback position, you're not going. You're not going. And, you know, you look at uh, Brady. Brady has made him cry many Sunday nights, you know, after him beating us. Everybody think it was this, it was that. It was great. Fantastic. It's all about the Jimmys and Joes. You got to have them. I don't care how much football you think you know. I don't care how hard you work, how good you prepare. How was Andy Reid to work for? Great. Didn't put what you did because I said not. Not at all. You know, the only thing you hear him say a couple of times on Sunday, uh, stay away from that call a little bit now. You know, uh, what you think they're going to do here. But other than that, never tell you exactly what to run, who to play. he give you your guys. And I'm sure at the end, when you start cutting, when they got down to the nitty-gritty, he made the final decision. It was fantastic uh, to work with. You know, you're going to put points up. You're going to have the team ready. All you're going to do is play defense and not let them run you out of the ball. Did you realize that Patrick Mahomes was to become the great quarterback he was when he joined the Chiefs? Who? Who? Patrick Mahomes. Yes. Yes, I did. Simply because I have uh, two uh, twin grandsons that grew up in Marshall, Texas, and they have seen him in high school and in college. I played from White House, Whitehall, wherever he's from, and they were from Marshall, and they have seen him play in high school. And when they drafted him, they said, Grandpa, you all got the steal, the steal, on the draft. Well, what are you talking about? This guy is a winner and can throw it. I said, yeah, you're supposed to throw the ball to Texas Tech as much as they throw it. He said, no, I'm telling you, he's unbelievable. And that's why I knew. He said, just, just watch and see what I'm telling you. And every Sunday night when I was working there and now, he always called me. What a tell you. What a tell you. But no, he, cha- he, he, he championed uh, Mahomes. All the way through high school, I played basketball, I so played baseball and football all the way through high school. And he watched all his college games. My grandson, uh, Devon, he's one of the twins. He's an encyclopedia <laughs> for college football. So did you, you retired after 2018. Did you kind of feel bad in 19 when the Chiefs from the Super Bowl said, you know what, if I would have just waited one more year? I was elated. I was elated so they came right back and said, oh, it's all, you know, you, you don't never know when they're going to do it, when they're going to do it. But it was time. It was time for me. That was, it, was, it was time, but I was so happy for them. And for, and truly, they should have won three years in a row. They should have won my last year, the year they won it, and then this year. What was it like coaching under and uh, playing under Lamar Hunt? Uh, you talking about the elder, the old, the elder, the, the yes, founder. Fantastic, fantastic. We traveled good. We ate good. We slept good. Uh. You know, none of them really like to pay a whole lot of great money at that particular time, but he was a, he was a terrific officer. He was. He was. And color seemed you... not to matter to him because we was full of uh, blacks on the team when I played set. How did it feel when you found out you were going in the Hall of Fame? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, for years, going down to the combine, Rick Gossel, I don't know if you know Rick. I know you know his name. I yes. You know him. He's a beat rider there in the Dallas Fort Worth area. When I was playing, he was an assistant to Bill Richardson, I think, in Kansas City. And we kind of stayed in touch, you know, over the years. And then when I started coaching, he said, Emma, it's been a long time. He said, but you're going to get in. So, so I do. He said, the one thing I admire about you, You've never had a group of people 
to write in your name or you have not called and asked the Lord. I said, if my work didn't present itself enough for me to get in, I won't get in. He said, you'll get in one of these days. And it happened. And even when it happened, the Super Bowl was in Arizona that particular year. I know I'm ran the race. And I went out there to pick up my ticket because we had to pick up the ticket in order to get them. And right. they tried to get me to stay for the announcement. I said, no. Nah. I said, I don't think I'm going to make it. And I said, as long as I'm waiting, why would I want to stay here with a bunch of strangers and then be with my family? Uh, so uh, we threw a group of coaches and I, we threw in that morning. Then we threw out that afternoon by 2.30, and they kept saying, you need to stay. But they would never tell me I was in. <laughs> so so uh, I said, no, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back. Maybe if they had told me I was going to be in, I would stay for them to knock on the door, whatever they wanted to do. But I said, no, I'm going home. And uh, I flew back to Atlanta and was down in the basement watching it. And then my wife, it took me six times for my second wife's jacket. She started hollering and screaming and saying, I know what was wrong. My son had found out before I did. He had called and told her by the time she made it downstairs in the basement, they were calling me on the phone and telling me right away. It was a wonderful, wonderful, and unbelievable feeling. And like I said, I'm so proud to uh, be a part. It's a great, great fraternity. I mean, I think my number is... Um, 254, I think that's my number. And the football has been in existence and the Hall of Fame been in existence as long as it, there's a lot of great players that might deserve what's not in it. And to be a part of that is very, 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 very happy. 